Hi, I'm Tom, coming to you from Cleveland, Ohio. Thank you for selecting this video. Today's video is the sourdough journey, beginner mistakes and tips. I made this video specifically for people who are beginners at making sourdough bread. There are all kinds of videos on the internet, but many of these videos are brought to you by experts who've done this for so many years that they've forgotten all the mistakes and all the questions that beginners have. So the purpose of this video is to talk through the entire process end to end of baking sourdough bread. Okay, hold on. This is gonna take forever. I'm his brother, actually his identical twin brother. I was born first. I do everything fast. He does everything a little, you know. He made this five part video and it takes about two hours and 45 minutes for him to explain to you how to make a loaf of bread. I'm gonna to try to move things along and get you through the process a little more quickly than my little brother. And to really focus on what are the common mistakes that beginners make and what are many of the questions that beginners have. So in this video, he goes through a very detailed description of the most common mistakes beginners make and then gives five tips of what you should do differently. We're not gonna spend a lot of time on this. Come on, Tom, let's get to the punchline. What's number one? So my first tip for beginning sourdough bread bakers is pick one recipe and stick to it exactly start to finish until you master it. Good, I'll take number two. Don't substitute different flours, it doesn't work. Okay, Tom, back to number three. The third most common mistake beginners make is inaccurate weights and measures uh, when you're baking bread. A cup or a tablespoon is a volume-based measure. It's not a weight-based measure. So we need to measure everything by weight. I'll take number four, monitor time and temperature. Look at a clock, buy a thermometer. Tom, what's number five? So the fifth beginner mistake that people make is impatience. Seriously? If you had patience, you wouldn't be watching this video, you'd be watching the five part video. So my video has four tips, his has five. Okay, Tom, tell us a little bit about the recipe and the process we're gonna follow. So the first step in our process is to select a recipe that you want to follow. So the recipe that we'll be using through this process is called the basic country loaf, which is one that many people follow. And we'll be following that recipe throughout this process, the tartine bread basic country loaf. What I like to do each time I bake uh, a loaf is I prepared a cheat sheet here. Of course he does. And I also leave space on the, the sheet here to keep notes because it's very important to write down the, what time you're starting certain things, what the temperature is. This is basically a three day process. Okay, Tom, mix the leaven. Let's get to the leaven. It's the evening of day one. We're gonna make the leaven at about 8 p.m. So then right when you think he's gonna put something in a bowl and actually start mixing, he does not. He starts to talk about what type of flour to use, what type of water to use, what type of bowls to use, what type of scale to use. Then he talks about the history of the metric system. Then he talks about weights and measures. And then right when you think he's gonna mix the leaven, he talks about the difference between a starter and the leaven. I didn't understand any of that and I don't think it's important. Okay, finally, put something in a bowl for God's sake. So the leaven recipe calls for Okay, let me help him out. So here's what you do. You mix the leaven. The leaven is one tablespoon of starter mixed with 200 grams of flour and 200 grams of water. The flour is a 50-50 mix of bread flour and whole wheat flour. Good, got it. Make the leaven, let it sit on the countertop overnight. Then he checks the leaven in the morning. He does this thing called the float test and then it doesn't float and then he waits a little while and then it does float and then he takes the test again and then it doesn't float. And then he decides everything's okay and he moves on anyways and he explains a lot of scientific details behind that which i don't fully understand but we finally have the leaven and we can finally get along with making some bread here well, let me move things along here so in the bread dough you mix 900 grams of bread flour 100 grams of whole wheat flour then he explains after we made 400 grams of leaven that you really only needed 200 grams of leaven and you don't use the other 200 grams i don't really understand that you mix that with 750 grams of water you mix it all up in a bowl he uses this special tool. It turns into some kind of shaggy ball. Okay, that step's done. Let that sit for 35 to 40 minutes. He calls that an auto lease. Then he calls it a fermenta lease. Then he describes the difference between the two, which doesn't make any sense to me. 
But anyways, it's a ball of dough sitting in a bowl. We're getting closer to actually making some bread here. Okay, then he adds the salt and he goes on for a long time describing like how you need to put the salt in a special place because so many people forget to add the salt. I mean, who forgets to add the salt? Is that something people actually do? Come on, that's silly. Okay, then he adds the salt. He mixed that in by hand, lets that sit for a few more minutes. Okay, so now we're getting somewhere. We have some dough, it's in a bowl, and then he starts this really complicated process called bulk fermentation, which is supposed to take four hours, which is a ridiculously long period of time. And then during the bulk fermentation process, he does this thing every 30 minutes called stretching and folding. He does the stretching, he does the folding, he waits 30 minutes. Then he does this thing called the window pane test. And then I think bulk fermentation is gonna be over, but it's not over yet. Then he's taking the temperature every five minutes and then he says the temperature is too low, so he's gotta get the temperature up and he creates this thing called a proofing chamber. And I'm like, a proofing chamber sounds like some kind of medieval torture device. I don't know what that is, but he gets the temperature up and then he's happy. And then he keeps stretching and he keeps folding. And this goes on for the four hours it's supposed to take, and then he decides it's not quite done yet, so then it goes four and a half hours, and he's taking the temperature. Then he measures the dough with a ruler to see if he's got the proper percent rise in the dough, and then he finally does, so thank God bulk fermentation is finally over. And I never thought that was gonna end. The next step, he checks back in, he reviews the recipe, and then he finally divides the dough. He divides it into one big piece for a big loaf, a small piece for a small loaf, and a small piece for some pizza dough. He divides it, he shapes it, he does this pre-shaping, he does this little folding of the dough on top of itself, then he flips the dough over, he uses his hands to kind of tighten the dough building something called surface tension, which I don't know what that means. Then he finally lets these little balls of dough rest for 30 minutes in something called a bench rest. I don't know exactly where the bench is, but he's doing something called a bench rest now for 30 minutes. Okay, we're done with the pre-shaping, and now he needs to do another shaping because one shaping is not enough, apparently. So now he does this thing called final shaping. He like pats it down, he's folding the dough, and then he folds it over, and then he rolls it up, and then he tucks it, and then he spins it and he does this final shaping process and then I hope we're finally done and it looks like we are. So he has the final shaped loaf. Then, then he talks about this thing called banatons. I don't know what that is. I thought that was some kind of clothing store that was around in the 80s, but he doesn't have a banaton. So now he's using a salad bowl to do this, which I guess works. Then the final shaped loaf gets covered up with this little stretchy, cover and then he puts it in the refrigerator overnight for 12 to 14 hours to do something called the cold retard final proof i don't know what any of that stuff means but apparently now we need to wait until day three to bake a loaf of bread so now we wait again so it's finally day three. I can't believe this is still going on. So right when I think we're finally ready to bake this thing, then he goes on and on about how you have to preheat the oven. So he puts the Dutch oven inside the oven, but you can't do it with the lid on. You have to do it with the lid off. And then he puts a special thermometer inside the Dutch oven because you can't rely on the oven temperature. He's trying to get this thing up to 500 degrees Fahrenheit, which is 260 degrees Celsius because he only uses the metric system. I don't know why. And then finally we get the Dutch oven heated up in the oven at 500 degrees. But before he puts the bread in the Dutch oven, then he puts this special baking pan under the Dutch oven to make sure that he doesn't burn the bottom. Then he takes the loaf out of the refrigerator. He dusts the loaf with a different type of flour, rice flour, because apparently you can't use bread flour for the dusting. I don't know why. Then he flips it over on a specially cut piece of parchment paper that he meticulously cut with a pair of scissors. And then he does something called scoring, which most people would call cutting. He scores this with a little tool called a lam, which is spelled lame, which is indicative of this three-day process. And finally, he puts the bread in the Dutch oven, carefully lowering it in with his specially hand-cut piece of parchment paper. And then while the bread is baking, he takes this time to go into a very long explanation of kitchen safety about using oven mitts and about using pot holders and what types of pot holders work best and what type of oven mitts work best. And be careful working with sharp objects like razor blades and knives and don't injure yourself and all that stuff's really important. 
but wow, he can really go on and on on that topic, let me tell you. Then after 20 minutes, the timer goes off. He rushes over to the oven. He excitedly takes the lid off to check something called oven spring. I don't know what that means, but I can actually see a loaf of bread for the first time in three days starting to form inside of this pan. And then he bakes it for another 20 minutes watching his timer tick, tick, tick. This thing just goes on and on. After 20 minutes, he takes the loaf out. He looks at it. He inspects it. He's not really happy with it. He says it needs a little bit more time. He puts it back in the oven for five more minutes. He's checking this thing constantly. And then finally, he takes it out and says it's done. And now right when a normal person would cut into this thing and eat it, this looks really good. Now what do we do next? We eat it. I have my knife, I have my butter, I like to cut crossways across the ear like this. I'm kidding. Oh, do you think I'm crazy? Never cut into a warm loaf. You always have to let the loaf cool for 90 minutes because it's still cooking. So put the knife away, just step away, put it in your drawer, it's tempting, put the butter away. Put the butter in the refrigerator. Whatever you do, do not cut into your warm loaf. So while the loaf is cooling, he reviews the process again. He reviews his notes. He goes over all the details of the whole three day long process. And we wait and we wait and we wait. And then finally, 90 minutes later, he finally decides to cut into this loaf of bread. So it's time to cut into this and see what it looks like inside. That's a beautiful loaf. That loaf came out perfectly. That's a nice loaf. It's a real nice loaf. This is the best loaf I think I've ever made. Good job, little brother. Good job.